Black is beautiful, shorty. Black is bold. Black is black, true, but black is gold. What's good, everybody? It's your boy Leek here for Sports League Podcast. And I'm here with a special guest. So, um, someone I just found out was my cousin, <laughs> Tiffany Murchison. Hello, thank you, and welcome to the Sports League Podcast. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So, Tiffany, can you um, speak about your um, company that you have in your in your proof? Yes. So, um, I'm the founder and lead PR strategist of TJM and Co Media Boutique. Our niche market are nonprofit organizations and small businesses, some politicians, but we're looking to move heavily into sports, primarily pre-professional sports, so college and high school athletes. Good, good, good. And we're based in Brooklyn. Oh, nice. Oh, cool, cool. Um, so, I know that you designed a reputation management workshop for high school pre, pre-pro athletes. So, what does that entail? So, the workshop is called Going All the Way Up, and it's a two-day training. The first day speaks about the um, brand identity. So it's titled The I in Brand Identity. And it teaches athletes how what they do can impact what they're going to do or who they're going to be later on in life. So basically just using examples from pop culture to show them how somebody might have been on top of the world one day and at the bottom of the totem pole on the next, teaching um, athletes about how what they post, how they behave in public, who's watching, all that stuff, how that impacts them on a personal level um, and the image that they want to build and who they want to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And then the second day is the me in social media, teaching them um, how to take control of their own narrative. So what they post, who they follow, who follows them, the conversations they engage in, really teaching them about the algorithms and the fact that things never are really deleted, how they can come back to haunt you, and then also a little bit about speaking with the press. Up until recently, college athletes were not allowed to have agents and publicists and all that kind of stuff, and no one was really teaching them how to engage with press so that they end up in the best light. And so the workshop focuses on that. The first day is on really building their character and their reputation, and then the second day focuses on managing it. That's important, really important, especially now with social media, with um, with a lot of uh, high schoolers having thousands of followers, people really watching everything you do, and then you have all these athletes now having um, big mixtapes and highlights of their plays and being not re- just shared on their profile, they being reshared on other right. major um, profiles. So. How do you um, manage, how do you teach them to manage to hold their image in a proper light when it's constantly being flipped around and things we share? So one of the things that we do is we give them a worksheet and we ask them to, and this is an engaging workshop, so day one they come, they, and we want to feed them, so mm-hmm. it includes breakfast and lunch, because if they're hungry, they're not going to pay me any attention. Yeah, especially um, when you're a teenager, you're definitely yeah, Absolutely. I have teenagers, they eat us out of house and home, so we know. Um, So, you know, so that they'll have breakfast and lunch and be able to focus. When they go home from the second day, they have homework that they need to bring in with them the following day. And what it does is it says, okay, well, who are you? Tell me what type of person you are. And they will write down, you know, this is who I am. I'm kind, I'm generous, I'm whatever. And then where do you want to be in five years, 10 years, and 30 years? Well, who do you want to be? And that encompasses how they want to be set up financially, if they want to be married, do they want to have a family, you know, thinking about after their athletic career what happens, right? Because, you know, we, only, we know only a small percentage of high school athletes, college athletes make it to the pros, right? So as you advance, that percentage dwindles down, and I think it ends up being like 1% yeah. of athletes that actually make it to the pros. And so who you are now what do you want to be doing 30 years from now? What if you don't make it to the NBA or the NFL or the NHL? Who do you want to be? Then I tell them, all right, now that you've done that, open your social media. Look at your social media and look at your list of characteristics and who you are and who you want to be and do the two match up. What does your social media say you are? Who does your social media say you are? And here are some tips to let you know that your social media is going left, right? Right. If you are embarrassed by it, if you don't want your parents following you, if you don't (laughs) want your teachers following you, the folks that you respect, if you're like, nah, y'all can't follow me, (laughs) then that's kind of a, you know, tall tale sign that something's awry. 
Are you arguing with people on social media? That's true. You know, too. all of those things. And then I say to them, okay, so if your social media is contradictory to who you say you are and who you want to be, then what do you need to do immediately to change it? Mm -hmm. And that's an actual exercise for them to do, for them to write it out, for them to, you know, really give it some thought and then work around how to start changing that image. Because we know stuff comes back to haunt you. That's very true. Right? But the difference is, is that, especially in our communities with people of color, mm -hmm. the bite is a lot harder than it is for people that aren't people of color. That's right. right? I've seen, you know, stuff, people do stuff at 17, 18, come back when they're 24, and we kind of give them a pass. But when it's a person of color, that bite is hard. The, and so they need to understand that. Yeah, there was a, um, a, a player from Ole Miss. He lost a lot of money in the draft because mm -hmm. he, his draft stock fell so much from posting a... It wasn't him that posted. It was someone that he knew posted a... Um, Laramie Tunsil. Yes, exactly. During he, the draft. Yes, he posted a... It was a picture, a video posted of him smoking. Uh-huh. With and, a mask on and a yeah, bomb. and mm -hmm. it just fell all the way down, lost a lot of millions of dollars, potentially. So He was um, predicted to be in the first five. Right. Right? Probably number one, but right. at least in the first five. Right. At the end of the day, he fell to 13. Mm -hmm. That equated to something like two to three million dollars in endorsements. Mm -hmm. Even if you look at Tiger Woods, you know, Tiger Woods <laughs> was a great golf player. Right. Sex scandal came, Tiger Woods was a black golf player, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he lost um, AT&T. He lost something like nine hundred million dollars in endorsements. And he Absolutely. was like one of the first black billionaire athletes. Right. And he fell you know, his worth fell tremendously because of the reputation crisis around his sex scandal, and then he had a DUI after that. And mm -hmm. so our kids don't understand that. And social media has everybody thinking that they can just have their lives be an open book. But you have to understand that, one, you need to manage who you are, and that you don't always need to bring your whole self everywhere you go. That's very and true. And so that's what we want them to learn. That's very true. And speaking on Tiger Woods, it's funny how not only did his his pocket suffered, his game also suffered too from the reputation. Absolutely. Taking that big hit from the scandal. Absolutely. You gotta think about it. You have enough stresses on you already, the stress to win. But when you're on that court, on the golf course, on the baseball field, and you're wondering, you know, mentally, who's really cheering for you, who's out there snickering and sneering at you, that's a lot of pressure. It's totally a lot of pressure. It's a lot easier when you're well liked. I mean, come on, you, you, you know. Mm -hmm. I can remember back in high school, you know, you did better in school if you were in the popular group because, right. you know, you kind of had no cares. Now it's, they're worried about likes and FaceTime and this and that and all mm -hmm. this other stuff. Retweets you can barely like concentrate, so. Right. right? So, right. absolutely. That's why I think Instagram now just um, decided to take away showing the actual numbers of likes that you have and then just say one person and others or one person and thousands of others. So right. it just, sometimes it takes away, um, it creates a little bit of anxiety in people and it creates, yeah. Well, you can still see your mm -hmm. numbers. Right. Other people can't see your numbers. So they can't compare with so you. So they right? can't compare. Mm -hmm. That's a double-edged sword for folks who have built their brand as mm -hmm. being social media influencers because now it's kind of difficult for me to prove to you that I have a million followers and I get so many likes. Um, when you look at likes versus followers, you can always easily tell if you have 30,000 followers and you have like 20 likes, then you know those followers were bought. Right. You know, so that is going to be a little bit of ambiguity for brands who are looking for influencers and ambassadors, but we'll see what happens. Right, right. So, now we're talking about brands now. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot of um, elite at high school athletes are becoming brands. They have these big followings, they have big publications following them, big publications retweeting their videos, we think publications posting their videos and tagging them in. So how do you get a, a star athlete buying into their brand and managing their brand? So I think it that's one of the reasons why we're talking to high school athletes and even some junior high school athletes. If you can see that there's a potential there, and I think just for children in general, we need to start teaching them about managing their reputation early, right? Because again, that stuff comes back to bite them on the butt. But workshops like ours, and you know classes and having mentors and coaches 
you know, pour into them about the importance and using these real life examples, the folks that they know, the folks that they look up to, using these real life examples to show how left something could go or how fabulous it could be mm -hmm. if you manage it well. It doesn't always have to be the negative, but you need to give kids nowadays someone or something to emulate. I'm a basketball mom. I became a basketball mom a few years ago. And my stepson, you know, plays at a D2 school. He's on a full scholarship. And he's a pretty even keel kid. But I hear him talk about some of the things his friends have gotten into. I've watched my nephews and a few others. And that's what really made me say, you know what, our kids need something. There's something missing. You know, what happens is <clears throat> nobody ever tells them no because they're the star athlete. Right. So they get their way. Parents aren't telling them no most of the time. Girls aren't telling them no. Um, coaches are, you know, wooing them and, and, and courting them, although they shouldn't be, but they are. <laughs> Keep it 100. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really easy, especially for those who don't have a strong family foundation. And that's not a knock on the parents. Sometimes we just don't have the time. You know, we're working. If we're a single parent, we may be working one or two jobs. We're like, oh, my God, he's at basketball. At least I know he's safe. But then there's a whole other element that comes in there. And if you as a parent don't know, you know, my son is lucky. He has two parents. You know, well, he has a whole village of people, actually, okay. that that's are always village. pouring into him. But even, I can remember us being in Supreme and him wanting to buy a shirt that was totally inappropriate. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely not. You will not walk around with that shirt on, you know. Right. And he's looking at me, you know, and then dad comes over like, yeah, nah, like, you don't need to, that's not who you are. You don't mm -hmm. need to. And I'm like, you know, somebody will think totally different of you because of that one shirt. You want it because it's Supreme and you could sell it later and all. I get it, but pick another one. Right. Like, no, you're not wearing that. And there are not enough parents that have that understanding because we didn't grow up in this age I didn't there was nobody knew if I my parents had to believe I was where I was unless they came looking for me right because right. there was no location finder there was no social media um, no cell phones to call you where to see where you're right. at exactly. I, I was teasing somebody and I said I had a, a smart beep beeper <laughs> that was like one ninety nine a month you paid the whole year at one time and my mm -hmm. mother beats me you went to the pay phone and you called back right? right and that was it you had codes for different stuff mm -hmm. but that was as much you know closeness as you got mm -hmm. there was no looking for me finding me there wasn't somebody with a video camera recording my every move you know so we had it a little bit easier if you add to the fool most of the time your foolishness stayed there where it was right. you could bury that right they don't have that luxury today no at all because now you have the live feeds so you can show yourself acting a fool like oh, i'm in the park you know acting a fool you know throwing eggs or you know, <laughs> being crazy i don't know whatever the, these kids do nowadays i don't know. but now you have this even stories too where you just like post like oh i was in you know while now on the train or something whatever right and now you just post it and now you have twenty thousand people watching it right. and then they can repost it and everything like that so it's definitely and you have no control over the narrative. Right, right. You have no control. I remember being on the train one day, and I, I really didn't feel good. And I sat down. I, like, kind of squeezed in between. It was a person that had bags and stuff. She didn't want to move over, and I was just didn't feel good. And I kind of squeezed in between the seat, and I mm -hmm. sat on the edge. Mm -hmm. And within, like, maybe two hours, one of my neighbors was like, was this you? One of her friends was on the train, took my picture, what? talked about how I squeezed into the seat posted it, somebody saw it, you know, and this was maybe, wow, I haven't been on the train going to work in a long time, so this mm -hmm. was maybe like six, seven years ago, but mm -hmm. still, news travels fast. Nobody said, oh, she really wasn't feeling well, she needed to just sit down, nobody would give her a seat, like, they didn't hear that narrative. The narrative was, this girl was so rude, she just squeezed herself <laughs> into a seat, you know, so you don't have any control over that, and you have to be very mindful when you allow somebody the opportunity to tell your story for you. And that's what social media does. That's very true. And like you said, you had no control over that post, too. You, mm -hmm. Someone else that you've been re recognized was on the train there with you took that picture. Mm -hmm. Somebody I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just so happened to know a neighbor of mine. Right. But somebody I had never seen before, didn't even know. You know, I saw her, I noticed her. Wasn't After the fact, I was like, oh, I did see that girl standing there. That's what she was doing. But I wasn't paying attention. I didn't feel good. I wanted to sit down. So. Right. But again... You know, the narrative was different once it got out there. Mm -hmm. No, thank God it was just me stealing a train seat. <laughs>
So now that these athletes, these these young athletes are becoming celebrities in themselves with these thousands of um, followers and taking pictures and videos, so how do you, when the narrative goes left, how do you go about correcting that narrative? First and foremost, rule number one is never lie. Okay. Um, that's a big thing. Never lie. And the second thing is take accountability. Right. Right? So tell the truth. Take accountability. I'm not telling anybody to send themselves to jail, but um, tell the truth. You know, don't definitely don't lie. Take accountability. Um, if an apology is necessary, then an apology. But then there needs to be some action behind it to show that you are not just sorry you got caught, but sorry for the behavior. Because there's a difference, right? Some folks are just sorry they got caught. They don't understand why they shouldn't have done it. So there needs to be some sort of accountability and understanding. And then some action to make amends or undo or whatever it is. And, you know, if it's you know, kids wilding out on the train, right, or maybe graffiti or whatever, then mm -hmm. you need to go clean that graffiti up. That's the action that you're taking to make sure that you are, you know, it's like, you know, reparations, so yeah. to speak, for what you've done. Mm -hmm. But there definitely needs to be honesty, accountability, apology, and action for sure. Okay, okay. So, um, say there's a, say you have a client who's like a rebel, like who just does not care and is totally fine with being a rebel. Do you try to polish their act, their image? They're or? not my client. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a mama, and mm -hmm. I'm a mama first. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the youth, I really do take the time to try to get through to them. The other thing is the folks around them need to understand the same concepts. So the coaches, the athletic directors, the parents need to also understand what is at stake and the, the, the athlete needs to understand, listen, you're in jeopardy of losing this. You may not have it now, but you'll never have it if you keep going the way that you're going. If I find that, you know, and, and prayerfully I can get through to them, honestly, if I find that there just really is no turn, because some people are just hell-bent on being their own worst enemy, then I have to decide whether or not I should step out of the situation, right? Um, I can't do anything that's detrimental to my own well-being and you know can't be stressed out and you know have kids at home and everything but I've not really run across especially in youth the uh, the rebel that I can't get through to okay um, I've had some I've worked with some youth that have really given a problem to other adults in their lives mm -hmm. and for whatever reason I don't seem to have that same challenge um, I seem to be able to get through to them a little bit more or at least while they're in my presence um, for the most part. And it just may be approach, um, it may be background. You know, I've, I haven't always been the straight and narrow. You know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth and I'm very transparent with you today about some of my own struggles, e girls included. You know, and I'm like, hey, listen, look, I went through this, I did this, these were stupid decisions. You know, I learned from them and this is who I am now and I'm successful and you can be too, but you have to make the decision. Once you show them that it's really about them and not about the people around them, and that's part of the challenge. Our kids, especially our athletes, get used as pawns a lot of times. Grown folks are more worried about the benefit to themselves as, as opposed to the benefit of the kids, right? And so now, and I'm concerned about that with this NCAA ruling. I'm for it, but I'm leery um, because there are vultures out there. That's very true. But once... And I think this is with any human being. Once you see that somebody has your best interest truly at heart, then you're ready to start looking at yourself differently as well. And I think that's really what happens. But if I get somebody that's like totally crazy, then they're not my assignment. If I can't get through you in a certain amount of time, then I'm not the one for you. Okay. So you mentioned briefly about the uh, NCAA ruling. Can you expound on um, how do you feel about NCAA? AA athletes finally being able to redeem um, the benefits from their likeness, their images, and their name? I think it's a long time coming, but I also think that the timing is not right. Right. The NCAA says they are going to put this into place by 2021. 
well, then I think we need a whole lot of training, mm -hmm. a whole lot of character building, a whole lot of reputation management, a whole lot of media training between now and then. For the kids that are, you know, like I said, on a scholarship or, you know, they're playing sports, they're usually pretty good. But you have some athletes that are in college playing on a team. They can't even go to McDonald's on a Saturday. They're true. struggling to pay for school. Even sometimes with scholarships, they have just enough to keep them in the school, but there's nothing else for their outside, you know, activities or just life. Like, they can't buy toiletries, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to think about it. Scholarships don't provide every single thing, right? We still send stuff down to our son, you know, whether it's he needs a haircut or just spending right. money or whatever. Right. So when I think about that there are kids who without that program may not eat three meals a day, right? They need to be getting paid if the school, the, the, the universities, the colleges and universities are making millions sometimes Hands of dollars this, right. off these kids. Right. And the kids can't, they're not getting anything extra from it. You may be giving me $200,000 in a scholarship, but if I'm your star player, you're making two million off of me. That's right. Ticket sales, uh, swag, you name it, mm -hmm. right? The people aren't coming to see the school. They're coming to see the athlete that plays for the school. Right. So they should absolutely get some benefit from that. The part that worries me is that, again, when you put hands money in the hands of someone who is not mentally or emotionally ready to handle it, you've seen you know, athletes go to the pros, get these large contracts, their first check, they're balling out. Right. You know, and that leads to the partying, the drug abuse, you know, alcoholism, the girls, and it's, it just opens Pandora's box. Right. So while I do think that these children or athletes or young adults, I rather should say, mm -hmm. these young adults definitely do need to get paid for what they do, there needs to be some sort of parameter in place to make sure that they're being fiscally responsible with the funds that they get. Now, I've not seen anything about how much money it will be, right? Right. But I know I called my son last night and I said, what do you think about it? And he said, well, uh, I'm good, you know, <laughs> but some of my friends or maybe some of my teammates or whatever the case may be. So he did talk about that, the fact that, you know, he knows people that play for, te you know, college teams, university teams, and they don't have money to get a hair coated. They don't have money to buy certain things. And so he said, so I think it's good. If you look at like I think it's Lisa Leslie they're still making money off her jerseys Wow and there's another one um, I can't think of her name right now I remember Chris Webber he mentioned he was talking about he was walking by the bookstore and they had his jersey selling crazy amounts of money right but he's over there struggling came and buy a bird to eat for dinner you know so it's right. just, it's just crazy they're struggling. in video games mm -hmm. they're in you know, how could you not then allow me to have some sort of, again, I'm not controlling the narrative. Right. You put me in a game. Right. But on top of that, I'm not getting the fruits of my own labor. Right. Because if I didn't play the way I played, if I didn't use my God-given talent, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be in that game. You wouldn't have your stadium filled. Right. So, no, definitely they should. What worries me is the management side of it and, and how much it's going to be. Should it be put up? Should some of it, you know, have to go into like a trust for them after college? Or There needs to be some sort of fiscal guideline around it because they're not ready. They're not ready to manage the money. Mm -hmm. so I remember Ed O'Bannon from UCLA. Yes. He put the uh, case up against, Yes. Um, I think it was EA Sports because his name and likeness was used in the NCAA March Madness basketball game. Yeah, he actually sued the NCAA mm -hmm. because it's the NCAA that gives the permission for EA Sports to use the likeness of whatever player. So, yes, he did. He sued, and then somebody else sued him. That they didn't, He didn't include them in the lawsuit or something along those lines. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I'm trying to think of who it was. So they were actually on... Um, the shop right. with LeBron, yeah, and the, the governor, governor mm -hmm. signed the bill right there right. on the show. Mm -hmm. And you had Rich Paul, you know, all these, and, and he brought it up. He was like, it introduces 
the college students to the business side of sports early on, which I totally agree with, and right. that's a good thing. Right. But again, where's the team in place now? And is that the coach's responsibility? The coach has, you know, coaches have a lot of responsibility when it comes to their athletes, right? They're like a family, right. so they're taking care of them. They're trying to keep them away from the girls, trying mm -hmm. to keep them sober, trying to make sure their grades up. You know, mm -hmm. coaches are... So do you now give the coach another job to do to now become their financial advisor or financial planner you know if this kid gets a thousand dollar check you know is the coach going to be like let me see your bank statement <laughs> do they you know some of them don't even have bank accounts they don't even know how to use a debit card or write a check or anything so right. there definitely needs to be something in place before 2021 to make sure that they are um, fiscally literate knowledgeable and responsible Perhaps it, since coaches have assistant coaches in like football, you have um, OCs and DCs, offensive mm -hmm. and defensive coordinators. Maybe there should be like a, a team appointed fiscal manager or something. Money manager Absolutely, or something, like something, something. You gonna see them balling out? They are gonna go cash a check, <laughs> put the bills on, yeah. you know, Instagram. <laughs> They're gonna put their phone into the air. Right. Like, ah, I'm getting paid. I just dropped thirty points. And right. I got 30, right. Thirty bands. So. And then what happens to the players that aren't the star players? That's another conversation. Right. Does the whole team get something? Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely think it should be on a sliding scale. Right. Um, but if it's the use of image and likeness, then you're saying, okay, well, it's just these athletes because it's just their image or their likeness. They definitely should get something from it. And I think they should get something, you know, ongoing. If I am out of the league 15 years and you're still selling my college jersey, right. then I should still get royalties. You know, right. artists get royalty checks every for every time a record's played on the radio, mm -hmm. right? So everybody, the writers, the publishers, the producers, the vocalists, everybody gets a royalty check for every time that record is played on the radio. Right. For years to come. Mm -hmm. If you are selling my jersey and I'm like 70, <laughs> my money. Tell mm -hmm. me my money. Mm -hmm. So That's funny because you know how many times they play um, September by Earth, Wind & Fire, so you know they're getting paid. <laughs> And I'm a Penn Stater, so we have Franco oh. Harris come to school all the time. So right. I'm pretty, there's like Franco Harris jerseys everywhere. There's LeVar Arrington jerseys everywhere. So, I mean, he's, Franco Harris has played in the 70s and for the Steelers. So I'm pretty sure if he was still getting his jersey sold, he could still make some money while into his. Right. Because a lot of athletes, again, they didn't have anybody to teach them how to manage their brand, how to manage their finances. And when you're on top, there's a whole bunch of people there. And it looks like they have your best interests at heart. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But when that goes away, so do the people because they're chasing the next big athlete. Right, right. And so all these things that somebody else did for you, mm -hmm. now you're like, oh, snap. How do I figure this out? What do I do? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever taught me how to manage my own brand. Nobody ever taught me how to manage my money, right? Mm -hmm. And so... How many athletes do you have that were amazing and now they're broke? It's very true. It's a lot. It's a lot. And it's just mis... It's not that they didn't get the money. It's just mismanagement mm -hmm. of the money. Very true. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of revenue from the schools, um, there's an argument that the players should not be paid because, one, other programs like swimming team or water polo or field hockey... They benefit from the revenue generated by the football team or the basketball team. What do you say to that? I say that if it's revenue generated by ticket sales or something like that, and it's across the board to the school, to the sports program, that's great. Mm -hmm. But when you put me, an individual, mm -hmm. on a shirt in a game, on a on an ad, that's a totally different story. Um, I'm definitely not and never have been that parent or that person that's like, oh, everybody wins today. Nah. <laughs> you know? No orange um, Yeah, like, you know, oh, you know, and when you're kids, it's different, but there's levels mm -hmm. to quote Jay-Z. Yeah. And if I excel, then I need to be recognized and rewarded for excelling. I'm not taking the shine off of anybody else, but this is me doing this, mm -hmm. and I, I want mine. Right. So I'm, I've never been that, you know, parent, if my kids were on a sport and one team lost and one team won and everybody got the same thing, I'm the <laughs> mad parent. I'm 
up in the stands where my arms folded like, what? Come on. I'm, mm-hmm. like, I'm taking my kids for something extra because they worked hard for it. And, you know, if there's no real reward, then you kind of get, you know, like complacent and discouraged. So I don't believe that if I'm on an ad, everybody else should benefit from that. And I'm not talking about just the ads for the university, right? You have college athletes on big brand name stuff like right. Nike and Adidas, and that's a totally different story. Right. You're talking about stadium ticket sales, you know, swag from the school, like university T-shirts and sweatshirts. I don't care about none of that. Mm-hmm. But when you want to put me in EA Sports games, mm-hmm. you know, when somebody's watching me on Xbox or mm-hmm. like, no, that's a totally different level. Mm-hmm. And you could go swim over there. I'm good, <laughs> but you need to give these kids their check over here. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm going to keep dunking his ball mm-hmm. and he's going to give me my coins. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's very true, too, because um, a lot of reasons why people go to these schools, like uh, Penn State or USC or mm-hmm. UCLA mm-hmm. or uh, I'm trying to pick a Midwest school, Iowa, is for the athletic programs. Even they know right. they're not going to be there, they know that they have something to be proud of, they have something to root for, something to cheer for. Right. So there's definitely a reason for these players to be paid. Right. Definitely Absolutely. Agree. Yeah. Pay a man what he's worth. Right. Or a woman. Right. You yes. Know. Both. Yes. I'm, yes. Cro- I'm quoting <laughs> scripture, so it's <laughs> asking me for but pay a person, mm-hmm. you know, what they're worth. Mm-hmm. Pay them what they're worth. And if they earn it, then it's theirs. You know, um, let them then now give back or do some charitable within their means and their whatever their hearts desire. But no, I definitely do think people should be paid for what they do. Right. Um, speaking on uh, big names, like um, since Monday is going to be the national championship, there's going to be a lot of sponsors. It's like you see this commercial sponsored by this company, that company, and this company, and that company. Like um, Penn State was just in the Cotton Bowl, which is sponsored by Goodyear. Right. Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Just, um, right. Right. So you have these multi-billion dollar corporations sponsoring and hosting these bowl games. And then not to mention the NCAA March Madness, which is like sponsor, 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 mm-hmm. like, there, there are means for these athletes to be paid, so it just, it just boggles my mind, like, they have all these billions of dollars funneled into these programs, and they're not getting paid, which is ridiculous to me. Because nobody speaks up for them. Right. Nobody speaks up for them, and they either don't know to speak up for themselves, mm-hmm. or they're focused on, this is what I need to do to get me to the NBA, or to the NFL, or to the... Major League Baseball or hockey, whatever it is, their focus is, I'm, I, my son said, I'm playing one year, and then I said, I'm getting drafted, and I was like, okay, you know, now, do I think he has the talent to do it? Absolutely. Do I think that athletes should go one year? And the, I don't, because I don't think they're ready. Right. But... Again, especially those that are not on scholarship or either they're on scholarship but they just have a struggle. That money could mean the world to them. Mm-hmm. That could mean the difference to what their, you know, their younger brothers and sisters eat sometimes, you know, because a lot of them have a responsibility. They can't work, right? School schedule between athletics and school schedule and studying and you got you can't work. Yeah, you can't. Studying and training is like <clears throat> No. You can't. That's, you know, this is my job. Mm -hmm. This is my full-time job. Mm -hmm. I'm a student here, and then when I'm not a student, I'm playing basketball or I'm playing football. That's my job. Somebody else may be able to do work, study, or do whatever. I can't because I'm at practice at 6 a.m. I'm in class at 8 a.m. I'm at practice at 7 p.m. I'm coming back at midnight. I'm studying. I'm cramming. Like, Mm -hmm. I know that life. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have another means to make money. And especially with the way the economy now, everything is super expensive. Right. Everything is super expensive. So, you know, and if you think, like he said, Chick-fil-A, um, even like Red Bull, you get all these huge brand names involved. Right. And if you think about it, if I'm a corporation and I'm sponsoring something, if you look at the cost to put on uh a game of, of, you know, you have, if I'm giving a million dollars, I'm only giving a million dollars because of how much I'm going to get in return. Right. So folks are not looking at that rate of return. Where's all that money going? College presidents are getting um, increases in their salaries. 
you know, they're doing all these upgrades to the campus. Locker rooms are getting Locker million rooms, dollar upgrades. Right. The coaches are getting hundred thousand dollar bonuses just for going are, to the bowl and games. And kids are hungry. Yep. And then, like just like you mentioned with um, younger brothers, younger sisters, like Ben McLemore went to Kansas, mm -hmm. and brought his little um, sister with him to raise her because she, I, I don't know what happened to the parents, but he had to take care of his sister. Mm -hmm. And so he went, he left Kansas and then went to go pro and now he's playing with the Rockets now. Mm -hmm. But like, it just goes to show like these athletes really do have to like take on as all this, you know. And not that as a, a young adult, it should be your responsibility to take care of your mother and your siblings or your right. father and your siblings. I'm not saying that that should be a definite, right. but let's be honest. That's a lot of how the family dynamic is. A lot of the parents are sitting there waiting for the kid to go pro or to get a scholarship or something so that they could feel like they can breathe. Mm -hmm. There's been enough lack of financial literacy in the community of people of color that, you know, that's kind of just the expectation when you, you have a kid that plays sports in a lot of families, you know. And it's not... And it's not just people of color, but, you know, it can be across the lines. But right. most of the time, the families are waiting. Or they're glad you're away at school because that's one less kid that they have to take care of, one less mouth to feed. Mm -hmm. So you never know the pressure. And when you look at our athletes and say, well, they had a scholarship and they did this and they did that. Why did they go sell drugs over there? Or why did they go do this over there? Why were they scamming over here? Maybe they felt like they didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And nobody's checking in with them. Nobody's saying, you know, it's hard for you to be in school as a kid, you know, a young adult, be in school, focusing on playing the game, focusing on school, and you know that you have a brother and sister at home that are hungry, or you have a mother who couldn't pay the light bill. Right. Or, you right. know, and it doesn't mean that the parents aren't working or trying. Life is hard in America. Now, right. You know, so you can concentrate and live, you know, live a good life. you got a comfortable bed to sleep in. You got AC and heat and food, three meals, but your family's back at home struggling. That's hard for you to carry. Very hard. Um, and so they're not checking in with these kids and they're getting into trouble. Right. So there's talks about the one and done rule possibly being eliminated. How do you feel about that? Because there's some that, that feel like the one and done rule helps some of the athletes. Some, some feel like they don't even need to go to college. They just feel like they should go pro. I, so I'll go back to my mother used to say, when I remember being a kid and the teacher saying, oh, we want to skip her. And my mother said, all right, well, if you skip her from second grade to fourth grade, who's going to teach her what she would have learned in the third grade? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Right? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to yeah. me. But she, she's got a whole grade she's missing, right? Mm -hmm. I kind of feel the same way about that rule. Um, one and done. It's based on people making money off the athlete. It's right. not a benefit to the athlete. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm a great athlete at 17 or 18, and my freshman year is great, right, then I'm only going to be even better when I mature a little bit. Right. Give me some time to grow. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing they talked about on the shop, actually that same episode where they said, you know, but then when you are out of the pros for whatever reason and you don't have a college degree, then you get judged by that. Like, people are like, you don't have a degree? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think that a freshman should be drafted into, you know, a pro team. You got 20-something, you know, grown men and a young man who is influential, who doesn't know his butt from his elbow. Mm -hmm. You know, they need that time to mature, especially if you're talking about now paying them. Right. Right, because now if I got paid for an endorsement as a freshman or as a sophomore, right, and I got this check, then when I go pro, I'm going to be looking for even more money, right? Because, mm -hmm. oh, I got 500000 for this endorsement, so now I'm looking for, but I still don't know how to manage it. I still don't know what I'm doing with it. Mm -hmm. So I think people are worried about money, 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 but you're setting the kids up for failures. You want to use what they have early on before they burn out. Like, let's get them right now. Yeah. But their bodies are taking more toll. It's harder physically. Mm -hmm. And then mentally, emotionally, spiritually, they get stuck. It's hard. The growth is hard. I don't, I don't, they could get rid of it. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say something funny. Um, 
I actually skipped first grade, so it was kind of like, that's why I was like holding back my lap, like, I'm, like, oh. I'm yeah. telling you, my mother would always say that when they would tell, you know, we want to skip our, we want to skip it. She's like, well, where are they going to learn? What they missed, yeah. What they missed. To this, how do you do that? She would, I feel like, but when I became a parent, it kind of did make a little sense. Mm-hmm. And first grade, I think, is okay. Yeah, I just, you know, don't have to worry about building blocks anymore. Like, right. Yeah, but so. when you talk about, you know, from, you know, I'm, I'm in the eighth grade and you don't put me in the 11th. Wait a minute. I'm yeah. in the eighth grade you don't put me in the 10th. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. I'm missing chemistry here. I thought mm-hmm. this went in an order, right? Mm-hmm. So life has order to it. Mm-hmm. And it should. So I'm a fresh. There's a reason why you're a freshman and a sophomore. I'm a freshman. I can't drink. I can't go to a bar. But I can fight for my country. I can go to the military. World War III. Right? I can go and die. Mm-hmm. And I can get on the court and make you billions of dollars. Right. Right. But I can't drink. Mm-hmm. I'm not responsible to drink. I just got allowed to drive a car in most states. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I may not. I can't. You know, I'm 17. I can't even travel without my parents. You know, do I have a passport? <laughs> With, it's a dichotomy. Mm-hmm. Are they grown adults? Or are they young adults? You can't do the, you know, you can't do these things, but I can make you a workhorse right. for all these teams that are not owned by people that look like us most of them also. That's true. And speaking of that economy, I remember um, on both sides, I remember Ben Simmons mentioned in the Showtime documentary that, you know, being in LSU for one year was just a shame. He wasn't really even going to classes. He was just, just training all year. And then you have other guys who went to the pro street from the end. Um, Street, went straight to the pro street from high school and they just weren't ready at all. They weren't ready at all. They weren't ready to, to spend their money, weren't ready to just practice and play with the other guys because, like I said, like you said, grown men. Mm-hmm. And like you have to grow into your height. Like you might be seven feet tall, but you're still 70 feet tall and skinny and get knocked over. And these grown men are like strong, they're lifting for like years, mm-hmm. training for years, mentally tougher than you are because they've been taking. You know, trash talk and giving trash talk and dealing with real life, and you're just a kid just finished playing Pokemon on your phone or whatever. Right. So, I'll tell you, we, we would sit at my son's games, and dad is very vocal. He played basketball also, mm-hmm. and he's on the sidelines going ham. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, shh, you know, and I'd be like, don't, like, you know, don't. And he said, oh, he doesn't pay me no mind. And I'm like, no, don't do that to him. Mm-hmm. And I've watched a progression over the years where you could kind of see he would be a little. You know, like his dad's opinion was very important. Then as he got to be a senior, it'd be funny he'd go down to court and dad would be over there fussing and cussing and carrying on and mm-hmm. Malik would go by and go, shh, <laughs> you know, and I started laughing like, okay, now, so you you do see the mental progression of things. You mm-hmm. definitely do see, you know, like, but him, you know, it took a while for him to get that way. And I would say to dad, like, you know, he's not, you've gone through it. You're a grown, life has taught you lessons, da, da, da. He, you know, they're in a different time. I think kids are um, a little less resilient nowadays than maybe my generation. I think we were a little tougher. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we coddled our kids a lot. We struggled, so we try to give our kids everything that we didn't have and then some. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you got eight-year-olds walking around with, like, iPhone 11. There's no earning anything. You know, oh, you want it because everybody else want has it. Well, I'm going to give it to you. Right. Um, my daughter will tell you that's not how our house went. <laughs> <laughs> you got my hand-me-down when I got an upgrade because I'm the one with the job. You mm-hmm. know, so kids, there's there's a whole lot that's lacking. And the maturity is definitely happening slower I think in this generation and so no they don't need to just be 18 away from home you know coaching in college is very different than professional so you know with a college coach now I watch and you know the kids go to his house if they don't go home for the holiday and blah 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 all that kind of stuff nobody does that when you get to pro sports yeah that's right you don't Maybe you have a friendly teammate that brings you over and brings you over with your family, whatever. Right, more. but if you don't have a place to go for the holiday, you know, then, so it's very different. I'm trying to think of who else it was that was on the shop, and they kind of made that same analogy. They got drafted to Toronto, went to UCLA. Oh, my goodness, who was it? Went to UCLA, got drafted mm-hmm. to Toronto, and he said, I got drafted. I didn't even have a passport. I'm trying to think of who it was, oh. and I'm picturing him in my head, but his name just escapes me. But he said, I got drafted to go to Toronto, 
And he was like, if I had been back in California, my friends are back at UCL, UCLA, or was USC, it, I think. DeMar DeRozan, DeMar DeRozan, because he went to USC and he, went to, he got drafted to Toronto. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he said, I got drafted to go to Toronto and I never even had a passport. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. And he said going to Toronto was what matured him because he was playing with a lot of older cats. Right. And they were different. They weren't playing Xbox. They weren't on video games all day long. Like They were in the gym. They were practicing. They were, you know, sharpening their game. They were doing things differently. So he said that definitely was the best thing that could have ever happened to him because mm -hmm. that's where he matured. Right. But... He took that angle. Not all athletes are going to take that angle. Right. Some people are going to get frustrated and discouraged. So it's a double-edged sword. I think they need to stay in college a little longer. I think you need to mature. I think you need to know how to handle a loss. Mm -hmm. You could be the star player in high school because that's a very small pond. When I throw you into, you know, college ball, now uh, you're in a big lake. Mm -hmm. When you get to the pros, you're in the ocean, you're in the ocean dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, everybody was their high school star whatever. Exactly. You know, most of the folks there were their college, they were leaders at some point in time. Right. you got to learn how to handle the loss. you got to learn how to handle not having the time to play. Mm -hmm. If you don't get, like, there's a lot that your ego takes a hit. That's very true. And not just only the best in the nation. Now you have so many international stars. They got guys coming from other countries that were the best in their country, if not best in their region up to like the continent, mm -hmm. coming over and, and winning. And especially like getting used to losing, like guys who, guys who go first typically go from, come from winning programs. So they've been winning and winning and winning. Absolutely. So like you say you're a star from Duke, right? You've been winning and winning and winning. Now you go to the worst team in the league because they have the most lottery balls, whatever. Or like the NFL, you have the worst record, you automatically get the first pick. Right. So you go from winning, winning, winning to just losing. And not losing, you're losing badly. There's no hope and there's no winning culture there. So you got to learn how to lose. Which is a very right. good point, too. I started to say something about I won't, I won't just my own city. Oh, the Knicks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right yeah. down the street. Yeah, literally. <laughs> right down the street. I won't just my they, own They might city. hear us. They might hear us, too. But, um, I mean, I, I don't... Let's think about it. Um, I don't think I've been a Knicks fan since I was in high school. Oh, wow. And you're talking over 20 years ago. But I don't remember them having a really great team Yeah. since I was in high school. Well, 2001, they went to the finals yeah, against okay. the Spurs. Okay. So 2000. Yeah, but that was 20 years ago. Right. With Allie Houston with Charles Freewell, that was a good team. Well, sure, we did more than 20 years ago when I was in high school then. I just oh. celebrated my 20, I've been in high school 26 years. Wow. So, yeah, I'm dating myself right now. I've been in high school for 14 years. Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I can't remember being a Knicks fan since high school. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad's a diehard Knicks fan. Because he, is he from New York? Yeah, he's from yeah, the Elmers, yeah. Right, that's why. Yeah. And then we didn't have any other team. Right. Like, that was it. Right. We didn't have the Nets. You know, mm -hmm. the Nets just came on the scene, but if you wanted to be a New York person, you know, a New York fan, mm -hmm. that, that's all you had. Mm -hmm. You know, so we'll see. They, uh, they have some good things going on, hopefully, now. They have Taj Gibson, so. From Fort Greene. Yeah. Right. He's been doing a lot of work down there. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a nephew that works with him, so. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. They've yeah. been doing a lot. They did the, the basketball courts. We did the basketball courts down in Ingersoll Houses. Oh, okay, good. We did yeah. the holidays uh, ice skating. They had a, ice, a temporary ice skating rink built. Oh, that's cool. The court, so the kids got to ice skate. You yeah. know, again, some things that some of these kids will never get to do if someone isn't coming and giving back. Right. 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 So, and then they have a lot of stuff going, planning for the summer as far as the courts down at Ingersoll and stuff like that are concerned. So, he's doing good stuff now that he's here. Yeah, it's really good. He's yeah. been in the cold for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chicago, Minnesota. Right. Yeah. yeah. He, went from, he, went, he went to school in L.A. and USC mm -hmm. from Brooklyn all the way to uh, L.A. and then all up in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Then he was in the Midwest for quite a while. Yeah. 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 So he's here. So hopefully, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay. We'll see what happens with the Knicks. Well, cousin, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate you that coming amazing, on. That is amazing, right? I truly appreciate it. I want to say thank you for coming on and being the first woman on a, on a podcast. Oh, am I? How yes. dope. Oh, yes. Yay, me. Girl power. Black girl magic. Ladies. Black girl magic. Yeah. There we go. Um, so thank you very much, and I appreciate you for coming on. Thank yes, you. anytime.
All right. Is there any anywhere we can find your um, business? Oh yeah, I'm all over the place. Um, so at TJM and Co. Everywhere, um, and then at Miss Tiffany Joy Publicist everywhere. So we have two social media profiles, and that's on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. We're all over. Um, we're looking to do a large pilot of the training going all the way up, hopefully in Brooklyn in the spring. Uh, before people start playing for summer league, I'm okay. also going to look and see if I can get with some hoop group coaches. They do like at Albright and NPA. So we're really reaching out to see where we can integrate ourselves to teach this program okay. early on, so that the kids benefit from it. And we also want to make it free for the kids. Okay. Good. So we're looking to get folks to sponsor the program, so that the kids can just come and learn and not worry about it, and the parents don't have to worry about it. So we're definitely working on getting some sponsors behind this. Hopefully this new NCAA ruling will help us uh, push folks to want to get these kids prepared for what's to come. Great, 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 great. Thank you. And that was season two, episode one. And thank you for following on Sports League Podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Spotify, and Anchor, and Twitter. At Sports League Pod. Thank you. I appreciate you. Peace. Hey, uh, there's someone like you.